We'll begin by looking at Psalm 45, moving into verse, um, rather Psalm 46, and then closing tonight with Psalm 47. So let's begin reading in Psalm 45 at verse 1. I'll read the psalm and we'll get into it. Psalm 45, beginning at verse 1. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips, therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty. And in your majesty, ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness, and your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia, out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. King's daughters are among your honorable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house. So the king will greatly desire your beauty because he's your Lord. Worship him. And the daughter of Tar will be there with a gift. The rich among the people will seek your favor. The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. The virgins, her companions who follow her, shall be brought to you. With gladness and rejoicing they shall be brought. They shall enter the king's palace. Instead of your fathers shall be your sons, whom you shall make princes in all the earth. I will make your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the people shall praise you forever and ever. Now, as we pick up here in verse 1 and begin to look at Psalm 45, this psalm obviously is a psalm of love, and it's been referred to in that way. It's a psalm of love. It's probably what we would also call a wedding song, and it was written by the sons of Korah. This was written in celebration of the king's marriage. Notice with me as we begin here that the psalm begins with tremendous praise. And then in verses 10 through 12, we'll be looking at that in detail in a moment, the psalm actually contains counsel that is given to the bride before she appears before her groom in her beauty. And then it predicts that the children, uh, that children are going to ensure the king's name is eternally remembered. And that's what we'll be looking at in this psalm. Now, as you look at this, if you take notes, you might want to note that this psalm is really prophetic because it reveals a relationship between Jesus, our Messiah, and his bride. That's what this psalm actually gives to us insight into. Somebody says, how do you know that? Well, look at verses 6 and 7. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. That particular portion of the psalm is repeated in the book of Hebrews, and we'll see that in just a moment. So we know that this particular psalm is being written concerning Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, as you look at this, I want you to notice that uh, it's referring to the king who would be Jesus as well as his bride, and uh, I wanted to share with you a couple of things about that because when you study the Bible, the New Testament especially gives us insight into uh, what we normally simply call the church. But when you read the Bible and you read the New Testament, you notice that there are actually various names that are given to what we call the church. You'll note that when you read the Scriptures, for example, that the church is called the body of Christ. It's also called in Scripture the flock of God. It is called God's building. It's called God's field. It is the habitation of God. It is also referred to as the temple of the Spirit or the temple of the Spirit of God. So the church has a variety of names that you find it being referred to in the New Testament. In other words, it's not simply called the church, but there are various passages that you'll see that the body of Christ is referred to in a variety of ways. And one of the ways that the body of Christ, the church, is referred to in Scripture is the bride of Christ. The church is referred to as the bride of Christ. For example, in the book of Revelation in chapter 21, verse 9, uh, we read one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls 
filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb, the lamb's wife. That's the church. In Ephesians, in chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, the Apostle Paul has been writing in chapter 5 concerning uh, this mystery, this, this, uh, this relationship between, we, between Jesus Christ and, and those who have called Him their Lord. And he says in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. He goes on to say, this is a great mystery, I speak concerning Christ and the church. So marriage is actually a, a picture of the relationship between Jesus Christ and the body of Christ, the church. Jesus is the husband, and we, the church, are referred to typologically as His bride. And so this is what we're seeing here in this particular psalm. We're seeing a song that is a wedding song. It's a song of love, and it refers to the King, Jesus Christ, and His bride, and those who follow after Him. And that's what we're looking at. As we begin in verse 1, therefore, notice with me, he says, My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the King. Notice the psalmist makes it clear that he has been moved or inspired to write the song. That's what the word overflowing is referring to. My heart is overflowing. The word overflowing, my heart is literally boiling over. I've been inspired. And, and this, the inspiration that I have is, is flowing out into a hymn of praise for the king. And as a matter of fact, when he says, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer, he's saying, God is moving on my heart so quickly and so powerfully that my, my tongue is outrunning my pen. I've got so much, in other words, that I would like to write down that, that I am thinking and speaking faster than I can even write. And so my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. I'm inspired by God to write concerning this. So he says in verse 2, You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. So he's describing Messiah, the king, and he's saying you are beyond any man who has ever lived. Of all human beings who have ever lived, he is saying, you are the most fair. Grace, he says, is poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. So he's saying that you have an, an outer beauty. You are very fair. There is something about you that is so winsome. There's something about you that is so attractive. You are more fair than any man who has ever, ever lived. Now, here's a, a, a thought for you. As I look at Scripture and all, I have come to realize that, well, it is true that I'm certain Adam was an incredibly, incredibly handsome man, the very first man who was ever created. And I know that Eve was extraordinarily beautiful because the Bible says when Adam saw her, he said, whoa, man, woman, you know. Bad theology. I've been at the pastor's conference and roll taught. But... But I do, I know that Jesus Christ, the second Adam, was absolutely attractive. But the question has to be asked, in what way? The question has to be asked, is he ever described in Scripture as being, you know, tall and handsome? And you want to know something? Of course, the Bible never even really describes Jesus Christ. And yet, the psalmist says, you are fairer than any man. The question has to be asked, is he saying that Jesus' Messiah, King, was his outer appearance the thing that made him attractive? And I believe that it was the grace that poured out of his lips. There was something about Jesus Christ that was not in any way intimidating to anybody in the sense of him being approachable. And grace poured out of Jesus Christ. And the grace that poured out of Jesus made him fairer in, er, in every way. The beauty of his heart, as it, was, as it was revealed through grace pouring out, made him the most beautiful person you could ever, ever, ever be around. And uh, just by way of a, a quick application, I honestly believe that you can be a very outwardly beautiful person, but people could say, what an ugly person. 
because your heart's not beautiful. And I, and I have seen people, both male and female, that, that some would say are not striking. You know, they're not the kind of person that you're going to look at a second time normally. But you walk away from those people and you say, what a beautiful, beautiful person. Because it's the grace that proceeds out of them. There's something about them that makes you comfortable. There's something about them that makes you feel like they care. That was Jesus Christ. Absolutely no doubt about it. And so grace would pour out of Jesus Christ. He's saying in verse 2, you're fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Grace pours forth from you. Isaiah 50, verse 4, is a messianic psalm, and in that psalm, uh, rather, a uh, messianic chapter, and in that chapter, um, Messiah speaking, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who's weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. In Luke chapter 4, verse 22, concerning Jesus, the Bible says, all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. John 1, 16, speaking of Jesus again, says, of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. So grace pours out of the king. Gird your sword, verse 3, upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty, and in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness, and your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. So this is a picture of, of the Messiah, Jesus coming. But I want you to notice that as he's coming, uh, he, and it says, gird your sword, as he's coming, he's not coming as as the Savior, He's coming as the conquering King. Remember His very first appearance when Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem. Remember that He rode on the, on the back of, a, of the foal of a, of a donkey, and He came in in peace. When He returns, as it's recorded in the book of Revelation in chapter 19, when His second appearance is in His second coming, uh, he, he actually rides on the back of a horse, and He comes bringing war. And so he comes vanquishing his enemies, and that's the picture that we have here. Psalm 110, verse 6 says, He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He'll execute the heads of many countries. Verse 4, when it says, In your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. Your right hand shall teach, your, uh, teach you awesome things. When he speaks of your majesty riding prosperously, prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness, that's really the platform of his rulership. And I want you to see the three elements that, that are going to make up the way that he rules. It's going to be truth, humility, and righteousness. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. That's obviously different than the platform that many politicians run upon today. I wonder how many votes you'd get if you stood up and you said, you know what, I'm going to have a platform that consists of three things, truth, humility, and righteousness. Vote for me. I wonder how many people would want to vote for that politician. I wonder how many people would believe that he's truthful. I wonder how many people would think that he was meek or humble. And I wonder how many people would want to vote in righteousness. And yet Jesus Christ is going to rule with those three aspects. That's the point he's making. His kingdom is different. And the way he rules is different also because the principles are eternal. The Bible in Psalm 89 verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. And so that's how he's going to rule, in truth and in humility and in righteousness. In verse 5, your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. The nations will fall before you, and your glory shall be revealed. Now, who is he speaking to? Just a king? No. Verse 6, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces by which uh, they have made you glad. King's daughters are among your honorable women. And at your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. So his, he's righteous in the administration of his kingdom. And I want you to see this. And in his kingdom, it is filled with with joy. The Bible refers to Jesus in a variety of ways, so much so that we refer to him as a man of sorrow, one who's acquainted with grief, 
Well, I want you to listen with me for just a moment about this. You read the book of Isaiah, you see chapter 53, and it speaks concerning Jesus Christ in that way, a man of sorrow acquainted with grief. And yet, when it speaks concerning the way that he rules, God says Messiah is anointed with gladness. In the kingdom of God, there is no sorrow. In the kingdom of God, there is no pain. In the kingdom of God, when we are in heaven, you're never going to cry another single tear, another tear. You know, guys, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll share with you something on my heart. Just take a moment. When our, our church was young and all and we were beginning to grow, I used to say, Lord, what do you want to do with this, this group of people? And the Lord laid it on my heart that he was going to do a work and it was going to continue to grow numerically. And I thought, well, that's great. Well, one of the things I never thought about is what happens when you have a numerically large church. And, and, and what you have when you have a numerically large church is a lot of joy and a lot of sorrow. And we go through sorrow. We go through series of sorrows here in this fellowship that are severe because we have friends that we, that we see uh, contact illnesses and, and, and they pass away. And, and, and we're in a season of that even right now. Just, just recently, within the last two weeks, some new believers who were in our fellowship lost their nine-month-old baby to leukemia. A nine-month-old baby, a little guy. And I have a grandson who's only a month older than that. And when the news came to me, I was in front of my screen at home. And I read, Baby Adam died. My wife was sitting behind me, and I just started to weep like I am right now. And Marie goes, honey, what's wrong? And I said, the baby died. I'm telling you, in heaven, there is no sorrow. In heaven, there'll be no grief. There'll be no daddies bearing the babies. There'll be no mamas who are not going to be able to hear that little voice in the morning ever again. Because in heaven, there is no sorrow. And I have to tell you, as we go through seasons like this, as I go through the season as a pastor, you know, eulogizing eight-year-old little girls who had a five-year struggle with leukemia and finally went home to be with the Lord, as we go through these kinds of things, these are the scriptures that speak to my heart. These are the ones where the Lord says, I'll wipe away every tear from your eye. There's going to be a time where there is no more pain, no more suffering, no more death, no more sin, no more anger, no more bitterness, no more grieving, none of that. The former things have passed away. All things will have been made brand new. You see, and so as I was reading this today, I was thinking about that. As the Scripture tells us that Jesus Christ anointed one of God. And notice that in verse 7, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness. That word anointed there speaks of, of the fact that Jesus Christ is the anointed of God. You see, the word Christos, Christ, speaks of the anointed one. In Hebrew, his name is Yeshua HaMashiach, and that means the anointed one. Uh, Jehovah is salvation, the anointed one. And so when it speaks of Jesus, his name is Jesus, but his title is Christ. He's the anointed one, and that's what it's referring to. God has anointed you. It's speaking of the Messiah, and He has the oil of gladness. He goes on in verse 8, all your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cast you out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. And so continuing on there, He's pointing out that His, his garments are wonderful. There's a wonderful scent to them. And, and the guests who are there present as he's getting married are all honorable. And notice it says here that his queen is standing adorned in the most costly gold that you can find. In verse 10, he continues on and says, Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house. So the king will greatly desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Worship him. And the daughter of Tyre will be there with a the gift. The rich among the people will seek your favor. So in verse 10, when he says, Listen, O daughter, consider, incline your ear, forget your own people and your father's house. He's saying to the bride of Christ, you need to no longer have this affection for anything other than your husband. You need to have a heart. That's the point he's making. If Jesus Christ is your Messiah... If I'm speaking to Christians, and I know I am to the majority believers, the point he's making is a very simple one. Then you can have no other God before him. 
There can be no rival throne. There can be nothing that comes between you and him. And so when Marie and I get married, I accept her with no other boyfriends. It's Marie and me. She's my wife. I'm her number one love. At least I'm supposed to be if she's marrying me. But if Marie marries me and says, oh, by the way, I want to continue going out on Friday night with so-and-so, and I still have some dates that I had made before we got married with this other guy. But, you know, you know, come on, let's be open about this. I'd say, come on, give me a break. You've got to be kidding me. Why is there a rival for my affection? If, if you and I are not dating, if you and I are committed in marriage, then and in what way and, and do you ever think, from what planet are you, if you think that I'm going to say that's a good idea to continue going out with other guys, you've got to be kidding me. And yet, unfortunately, what we have sometimes in the church is people who are confused on that very issue. They want to be the bride of Christ. They want to go to heaven. But they have rival thrones. There are affections that continue to compete for their heart that they are more than willing to yield to temporarily with the hope of going to heaven. And he says, that's not the way it's supposed to be. He says, forsaking all others, you're clinging to me. That's the way it works. That's how it's supposed to be. And it's not until love dies. It's, it's a commitment for eternity that he's speaking about in all, you see. The Bible tells us in 1 John in chapter 2, in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. When he says, do not love the world, Literally, in the Greek language, which the New Testament was written in, stop loving the world. Stop letting it steal your attention. Stop giving it all of your affection. Stop allowing it to be taken the place of your affection for the Lord. You know, that's kind of a radical thought for some people. They want to have Christ in the world, too. But the Bible says, no, that's not going to work. It never has and never will. You can't love both God and worldly pleasure, Jesus said. You've got to make a choice. Which one are you going to serve? The way Joshua spoke to the children of Israel in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. And as he's looking at the people, he simply makes a statement to them. Paraphrasing, he says to them, you know, you've got to choose uh, who you're going to serve, whether it's the gods that your, your fathers served on the other side of the river or is it going to be the God who's delivered you? He says, you have to choose this day whom you're going to serve. And then he goes on to say, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. We've made a determination. But you have to make the choice yourself. Because Joshua is basically saying, I've made a choice. My family has made a choice. We've determined to follow God. But we can't make the choice for you. You have to make that choice. And that's the way it works, you know. And so God is basically saying... You have to make a decision what your primary love is going to be. So he says, listen, O daughter, consider, incline your ear, forget your own people also, your father's house. So the king will greatly desire your beauty because you are so attached to the king, the king will be attached to you. He's going to be drawing close to you as you draw close to him. He is the Lord, so worship him. Now, some husbands right now underline this, saying, oh, this is good for me. I'll tell this to my... <laughs> the daughter of Tyre will be there with a gift. The rich among the people will seek your favor. And so, bottom line is, if you desire the Lord, He's going to desire you. And in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 8, James said it this way. He said, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinner. Purify your hearts, double-minded. When he says in verse 12, the daughter of Tyre will be there with a gift, the rich among the people will, will seek you out, God's people will be exalted, in other words, amongst the nations. Verse 13, the royal daughter is all glorious within the palace, her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. The virgins, her companions who follow her, shall be brought to you with gladness and rejoicing. They shall be brought, they shall enter the king's palace. This is a picture of the bride being brought before her groom dressed beautifully. Now, I want you to think about that for a while. Now, some, some, you know, some people have some really incredible weddings, you know. I was, I was um, 
told the other day that the cost of an average wedding today is somewhere around $40,000. That's why I'm giving my kids two bus tickets for Vegas <laughs> and a cigar band for a ring. I mean, you know, I mean, it's an awful lot of money. A lot of people are putting an awful lot of money into their weddings, and, and, uh, and you, you brides all know that your gown was, if you got a nice gown, it could be a very exceptionally, very costly thing, you know. And, um, and so, you know, I've done a lot of weddings over the years, and, and I'm telling you, you know, as a pastor, I've done a lot of weddings, and I've seen some extremely beautiful brides. You know, I, I remember one, though. where I married this couple and the guy was kind of young and didn't, you know, he did no protocol with the pastor. And so he said to me, he said, you know, pastor, I'd like to give you a gift for doing my wedding. And I, you know, that's awkward. And he says, what do I owe you? And I smiled, owe me. I, I said, well, just give me what you think the bride is worth. <laughs> so he gave me a dollar. And I lifted her veil, and I gave him 50 cents back. But, you know, I, <laughs> that's just a joke. I did not really do that. I'm just kidding with you. I'm, I'm kind of tired. Forgive me. I have seen so many beautiful brides. You know, they don't come wearing banana skins on their head, you know, with all funky-looking gowns and everything. They come just decked out, and that's what he's saying here. He's saying that she's beautiful. She's coming in a beautiful way. She's prepared herself, is what he's speaking about. In Revelation 19, verse 8, it says to, uh, to her, the bride of Christ, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. How does she prepare herself? By living a holy, separated life. That's how she prepares herself. By living a, a life that states, I'm in love with the king. I'm going to marry him. I'm faithful to him. I'm not going to dirty myself with anything in the world. I'm going to pursue him. And, you know, as a man, it's difficult for me to think in terms of being a bride, so I'm not going to try. But I like the image in the sense of having performed weddings I know that, that that beautiful little bride didn't just wake up and just step to the altar. She prepared herself. And as she had her time of preparation, it wasn't a day, it wasn't a week, it was several months, getting everything ready, choosing the gown, sometimes going on diets, you know, going to the right place to get her nails done and her hair done and, and her makeup done and all of that, totally preparing herself. So that when that, that music begins, the doors open up, everybody stands, turns, and looks in her direction, and they look at this bride. She's radiant. She's standing there just absolutely gorgeous. That's why the bride will get the bridesmaids the ugliest dresses they've ever seen in their life. So nothing distracts from her. That's the truth, and you know that, from her beauty. And that's a picture of her preparing. But it's not just the outward, because I have to tell you, I have done weddings with beautiful young ladies who did not remain faithful to their husbands. You know, the, man, the man's heart is, is going to safely trust in the woman because of her virtue. Because of her virtue. Because she's a beautiful woman inside. I can tell you as a husband uh, with my wife, I can tell you that I have never, never doubted that she's faithful to me. I've never had a thought that she could be anything but that because she's a woman of virtue. Not because I'm so smashing and so wonderful to get. She wouldn't, you know. That's true, but that's not the reason why. <laughs> it's because she's a virtuous woman who prepared her heart to be with her husband. And so my heart can safely trust in her. In verse 16, instead of your fathers shall be your sons, whom you shall make princes in all the earth. I will make your name to be remembered in all generations, and therefore the people shall praise you forever and ever. And so he speaks now not only of the fact that they marry, but there's fruitfulness in that marriage. He's speaking concerning um, their children. And the children, he's saying, are going to be royal. They're going to be royal princes. And it's a simple picture of the name of God being glorified through those who are birthed in the body of Christ and are the church and those whom the, the, the bride of Christ wins to Christ over, uh, you know, over our years of ministry. 
and thus ends Psalm 45. Now, Psalm 46 is also a psalm of the sons of Korah. Beginning at verse 1 in Psalm 46, he says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and, and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered His voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations of the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks, in, he breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Now I want you to notice in verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Notice verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Three times he wants us to know that God is a very present help in our time of need. Three times he points out that we can trust in him. And he also points out in this psalm, that in the midst of our, our struggles, in the midst of the storms that we go through, when, when, when we're going through so many things that feel like the earth has been removed from under our feet, he's saying you can trust in the Lord. You can have great courage in Him even in the midst of danger. He's saying uh, in verse 2, we will not fear though the earth be removed. And, and I know that I have experienced it when it feels like the ground has been taken out from underneath me. And I've needed a place of refuge, and I've needed a place of stability. I know that there have been times when sorrows have been like sea billows over me, drowning me, and I've needed a place of, of firmness where I could stand and catch my breath. There's nothing like having the earth solidly placed underneath you. There's nothing like that. And you say, what are we talking about? A few years ago, we were in Colombia. While we were there, we were in a uh, very remote place called El Secreto. And the secret place. And as we were there, we had some people who um, asked us if we wanted to go alligator hunting one night. We're in the middle of a jungle. Do you want to go alligator hunting? Uh, not tonight, maybe tomorrow. And, and let's, maybe we can get a boa next week, you know, anaconda. But alligators, no, not tonight, thank you. But one of the guys wanted to, Gino Geraci. He's a pastor in, in uh, Columbine. So he went out. He went out with these Colombians, and off they went. And those of you who've been in the jungles, and I know that some of you have, know, or even the forest when there are no lights and it's just pitch black and you can't see a thing out there. Well, in the jungle where there's all of this forest and you can't see anything, these guys, knowing the way, are taking Gino to go and catch an alligator. But they can't find one. And finally they do. They find a little alligator. It's only a couple feet long. And they bring it back to show us, right? As they're walking back, Gino is walking in front of the guys and he takes a step and he, there's nothing there, and he goes down. As he goes down, he reaches out with one hand and grabs the end of this, this cliff. He had stepped off a cliff and, and didn't know it. Of course, you can't see it in the dark. You can't see. So he's hanging with one hand when the guys who are supposed to be helping him got to the edge of the cliff, and he's trying to get up, but he can't. And so as he's fighting to get up, they looked at him. They say, do you need help? <laughs> yes one of them gets the alligator and says kiss the alligator <laughs> he married the alligator I'll do anything you want me to do get me off this cliff you know 
And he actually kissed the alligator, and then they pulled him out. He got his feet back on solid ground, and he's feeling good. The next day he goes to look, and it turns out that the cliff that he had fallen off was 30 feet deep, and there were jagged rocks right underneath him. Had he not, by the providence of God, been able to grab the edge of that and actually find a finger hole to hold his body up, he'd have died that night. And I got to tell you that he said, when I got my feet back on solid ground, there's just nothing like solid ground. And sometimes it feels like the earth has been removed from underneath us, doesn't it? Aren't there times that you feel like, well, the Lord is saying that in his word, if that's the word that we're getting right now. The point he's making is that you can be strong in him. Verse 2, we will not fear though the earth be removed and though mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Its so waters roar and are troubled though the mountains shake with its swelling. No matter what we go through is the point he's making, we will not be shaken. Why? Well, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle in the most high, of the most high. God's in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. In other words, even if you go through an entire night, the dawn does come and God is there to rescue you. He's always, in other words, on time. So you can trust in Him. The Bible in Psalm 62 verse 8 simply says, Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Now when he says there's a river in verse 4 whose streams shall make, the, make glad the city of God, this is a, a picture It reminds me of the refreshment that we receive from the Lord. A river, a river he's saying here that brings refreshment to us. We know the scripture tells us that the Spirit of God is living water for us. We also know that the Word of God is that which causes us to have our spiritual thirst quenched. And when you read through scriptures, for example, like in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, in chapter 17, you get an interesting picture, because it says in Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, will not fear when heat comes, its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. When you have this river of life running in you, it develops a strength in you. And I find it interesting. This was pointed out recently in the pastor's conference, and I thought it was a great thought. One of the teachers asked the question, why do you think that the Lord said that your walk is going to be like a tree planted near the rivers of, of water? Why didn't he say you'll be like grass? Why did he say a tree? Well, it's quite obvious. Because if I'm in my backyard and I just drop some sod down and, uh, and a small child comes and I've been putting some patch, you know, a child can go right down there and even if the sod's been there for, for a week, can walk up and see the different color, one's a little darker than the other, can reach down and pull it right up and bring it to me and say, look what I found in the backyard. <laughs> but, but, you know, if you've got a tree that is planted there next to a river and the roots are deeply in that, what child is going to be able to walk up and uproot a tree and bring it to you and say, look what was there next to the river? We're not like grass, are we? What we are are like trees. And our roots are deeply in the things of God. So when the storms hit you, there's a rooting that you have in the Lord so you're not blown over and uprooted. There was a guy who went to Scotland, true story. And he wanted to buy a particular cane that is, that is you know, basically carved uh, from a certain tree. And it is known worldwide for being the strongest cane that you can get. It's in Scotland. And so he went to buy the cane. And when he was buying the cane and speaking to the salesman there, he said, what makes this, this, this wood so hard? And the guy says, do you know where we get these trees from? He said, no. He shows him a map, and as he looks at the map, it's on a bluff, and the bluff is facing the ocean, and, and it's in a section that is icy cold. And the guy says, we, we use these trees that are on this cliff in this particular location next to the most severe weather conditions because the severe weather conditions make a strong cane. And the guy uses that as an illustration, so that's why we go through such pressures in our life. 
because it's in the strong conditions that our God produces a strong person. That's how that works. And God takes us as a tree and places us next to the river. There is a river. And what that river is is the Spirit of God, the life of God flowing into us through the Word of God. And that's why, guys, by the way, uh, one of the things the enemy wants uh, for you is for you to stop reading the Bible. He wants you to stop that worse than anything because he wants to deceive you. He wants to find a way to wither you. And part of the way he can wither you is from the roots because if you're not in the living water through the Word of God drinking deeply, your life is no longer going to be vital. But we're going to be like a tree, uh, river, uh, tree rather planted by the river of living water. He says, God in the midst of her shall not be moved. God's people are not to fear, is the point he's making. Though it seems like we can be overwhelmed at times, he always arrives in the nick of time. The Bible in Isaiah 59, verse 19 says, When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. In verses 8 and 9, Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Ultimately, the Lord is going to cease all wars. Ultimately, and that comes when Jesus comes. When Jesus returns, war ceases after that final war, basically. In Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, uh, Isaiah writes, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and He will teach us His ways. We shall walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That comes when Jesus is ruling and reigning. And then finally he says in verse 10, Be still, know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. So in the knowledge of this truth, we have peace. We have peace in our time of struggle because in the midst of our storms, our God is in control. Be still. That's a scripture, by the way, the Lord gave to me a long time ago and know that I am God. Stop fretting. Stop running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Stop running to and fro trying to find the answer. Can't you just be still for a moment? Can't you just breathe deeply and realize I'm God? And there's nothing you can do to change anything anyway. That's why you need me. Don't you understand that yet? The Lord has told me that so many times. Don't you understand that? You're so frantic with effort. You're always trying to make things right yourself. Do better yourself. Why don't you just be still? And why don't you just know that I'm God? If you can do that, everything else is going to work out. But if you keep trying to solve your own problems, I'll have to let you make a mess of your life for a while until you are still, and then you will know that I am God. And finally, Psalm 47, a psalm of praise. Once again, a psalm of the sons of Korah. He says, Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He's a great king over all the earth. He will subdue the peoples under us, the nations under our feet. He will choose our inheritance for us, the excellence of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. God has, has gone up with a shout, the, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have gathered together, the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong to him. He is greatly exalted. So obviously, shouts of joy and praise are, are, are being called uh, to, to, to worship God throughout the earth. And God is a great God. And that's something we need to understand, I think, more and more in these latter days. 
that He's awesome and He is worthy of our praise. All that He has given to us, we worship Him for that. Yesterday, we had an opportunity to take some time to, 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 to pray, and, um, and John Corson gave us a study that I thought was just absolutely excellent, and he pointed out that in Psalm 100, how the Scripture says, enter into His courts with praise, into His gates with praise, and, and singing and all, and we we're talking about that, and he was sharing about that, and he was saying, you know, he said, one of the ways that you should be practicing in your prayer life is entering into the courts with, with, with praise to the Lord and thanksgiving to Him. And he was pointing out something that we have, we have thought about out loud with you many times, how, how we as believers ought to be the most grateful people on the face of the earth. We should be. We should be. He said, you know what you ought to do? You ought to just sit down. And we actually went through eight steps of prayer yesterday, and he gave us. He said, you know, why don't you take three minutes to do this, three minutes to do that? And we went out and did that and, and prayed for about a half hour and all. And he said, you know, there, I, I would like you to think about how, uh, how many blessings God has given to you. I, I would encourage you to do the same thing. And you know what you can do? You can sit down and without qualifying them, you know, without saying, I wish things were better. You know, you can sit down and you can say, God, what have you given to me, you know, that I should actually be thanking you for? What have you given to me that I can praise you for? People say, he hasn't ever given me anything. You know, just think for a moment. What has God ever given you that you can be grateful for? And I was doing that yesterday. You need more than just three minutes. Lord, I thank you for my kids. I thank you for my parents, my dad who knew you and he's with you now. I thank you that my mama loves you. I, I thank you for my wife. I thank, I thank you for the church. I thank you. And you can just go on and on and on and on. You really can. If you begin to think, Lord, I thank you for my health. I thank you that, that I can walk. I thank you that I get up in the morning and I, and, and I am alive to serve you another day. I thank you for the, the air that you give me, the bed that I slept in. I think you can do that, guys, and you want to know what that does? It, prov it provokes you to, to an attitude of prayer and thankfulness, of joy. It really does. And as I was sitting there just beginning to count my many blessings one by one, I began to realize three minutes is not, is not a very long time at all. Thirty minutes isn't long enough when you begin to think about how much blessing God really has brought into your life. How many good things? You want to know something? We are such a very negative society. We, we, we don't want to say anything that's any good. I found it interesting that one of the news commentators was recently saying concerning the death of President uh, Reagan, you know what? We've, we've talked about him for a week already or you know, several days. You know, we've got to move on. And I'm thinking, what an interesting, interesting way to think. I mean, you were putting certain stories in front of us for the last nine weeks, and you want to get back to those stories. But for a guy who was a tremendous patriot, some of you may not have liked President Reagan. Perhaps some of you don't want me to talk about the president. Actually, well, I came to Bible study. But I'm trying to say, is I'm trying to say that we are so negative about everything that we don't even like hearing when somebody might have done well or done something good. That's our mentality. I mean, how many newspapers will be sold tomorrow if every page is filled with good news? You know? You know, I'm old enough to remember. I'll give you one more illustration. And that's really a lie. I'll give you more, but I'm pretending I'm going to give you one more. <laughs> I can remember when, when Kennedy was assassinated, I was, it was in November of 1963. I was 13. And uh, that's one of those moments everybody knows where you were if you were alive at that time and old enough to remember. I was walking from one class to another at Lakeside Junior High School in Norwalk. The announcement came over. The principal was saying President Kennedy was assassinated. I can tell you where I was when that happened. And the student body just stops, 13-year-old and 12-year-old kids, and we wept. And we wept. Tragedy. But you know what? Isn't it amazing, guys, that we, we only have one video of the assassination of that president. But when Ronald Reagan was shot, we have it from different angles. Isn't that amazing? What did America learn? America learned you better keep your camera on the president at all times in, in case he gets killed. We can get it on the news immediately. And that's how things are. That's news. 
It's got to be negative. What kind of news is it? Plane took off from Los Angeles at 8.44 this evening. Arrived safely in Dallas. <laughs> no, we want to hear something terrible. And so we can really actually be, um, you know, we can become very negative just by habit, just by our nature is already inclined towards bad news. And yet the Bible says, praise Him. Not only just praise Him, I want you to notice that He says, shout unto Him praise. I mean, He's speaking about exuberant praise, shouts of joys, shouts of praise, He is saying. And that's what's supposed to take place. We worship Him. We worship Him because He is worthy of praise. I want you to notice in verses 5 through 7 when He says, God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. And He says, sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with understanding. He's saying praise to God is joyous. And you know what? Sometimes it's even loud. You know, sometimes people get upset because the music's too loud. I had a lady in our church. We had a very small sanctuary at that time. It sat 400 people, 427. We used to put 475 in there, but it sat 427. And um, there was a little lady in our church who was 80 years old, and she sat in the front row, and the speaker was right in front of her. I mean, you know, her little wig would just, mm, like that. I mean, I mean... And I would worry about this grandma, and I'd look at her, and she's right there, and the speaker's right there. And so I asked her grandson finally, I said, doesn't that hurt your grandma's ears? He says, nah, she turns her hearing aid off at that time. I said, well, but she loved it. She loved the, the music. She loved the praise and the exuberance. You know, and, and there's some people who don't. You know, they think that, uh, that, that, that the church should be a place and the, the, the word, it should be a reverent place, you know, a somber place. Now, all of us have heard the name J. Vernon McGee. And J. Vernon McGee was a crusty old guy. And, uh, and, and I, just, I just absolutely loved J. Vernon. I really did. And, and he still ministers to my spirit, though he went home to be with the Lord so long, his, his radio program still is being played. And I listen to J. Vernon when I can. And this is something that J. Vernon McGee said. He said, someone asked me if all the noise did not disturb me. I replied, no, it helped a great deal because they're right with me. And he goes on to say, I think what many people call reverence today is really deadness. There's a lot of reverence in the cemetery. <laughs> no one disturbs anybody or anything. Then he goes on to say, I think we need a little life in our services. <laughs> now, this is an old guy you would never think would say that. You know, if I had Jay Vernon here, I'd think, ooh, tone it down a little bit. But Jay Vernon says, no, man, I enjoy that, you know. I can't picture him doing a moonwalk or anything during worship, but, <laughs> but I'm certain they would have liked it. I liked it an awful lot. I had John MacArthur out once. He was doing a study for us. And, and so I thought, well, maybe we should do some traditional hymns for him because he comes from a different church background than ours. And I was talking to him in the back and he had said, you know, well, no, I like Calvary worship. He says, I like, the, I like it. He says, I like, there's something about it, you know. It's called the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God in worship. And, and there's a praise and a joy of all people. I mean, let's face it. I went to a, a Dodger game when they won the World Series. So this is ancient history, guys. The last, <laughs> the, the last time they did that, I went to the game that uh, we were playing Oakland, the first game, and, um, and we were down, and we brought in our pinch hitter and Kurt Gibson, and I was on the right field line there, and he hobbles up, you know, very dramatic, and the guy couldn't play because he was so crippled, and they put him out there, and he's fouling the ball off, fouling the ball off, and then he hits the ball. And I was there in the line, so the, I saw the ball just coming on up like that and just went past us, and I saw Conseco standing there just watching it go into the stands, and everybody erupts in this incredible, ah, 
like that. It went on so long. We eventually got to our cars. We're driving out of the stadium in a long line, and you could still hear thousands of people in the stadium screaming for Kirk Gibson, who just hit the game-winning home run. Or when Kobe the other day goes up and bang, hits that, or Fish hits that four-tenths of a second, and the place erupts. These are people who think you're freaky because you sing loudly. You know what I'm saying? So sing unto God, he says, <laughs> with the sound of a trumpet, sing praise. Why? Well, God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have gathered together. The people of the God of Abraham, the shields of the earth belong to God. He's greatly exalted. Why praise God? You praise God because he reigns. You praise God because he's sovereign. You praise God because we win in him. And because that's the case, of course we praise the Lord because God is worthy to be praised. May God help us to do that.